Common Ground was a, its own sort of project or its own service within a bigger service uh, or an agency. And um, the, uh, they were essentially running a kind of shelter workshop day custody program in a small, uh, uh, small town. And um, the uh, director of the, of the Common Ground program at the time uh, and uh, uh, particularly the, the um, a person just over them, this woman, uh, uh, who was, a, I think, maybe the director of the agency, uh, just was very unhappy with this program because of the custodial nature of it. And she wanted uh, something more socially inclusive, more individualized, and more um, uh, growthful for the people. She didn't want to just see people have a place to go in the daytime, but really grow and develop. Well, that uh, uh, kind of brought things to a head because uh, she, uh, to make a long story short, she decided to bite the bullet and close the old program and open the new one and people were free to reapply for the jobs in the new one, uh, but it would be a new program. And the new program were these three kind of big objectives of you know, get, a, get a, a life in the community and take advantage of the community, uh, do it one person at a time, and to be uh, uh, in arrangements that you know, people found fruitful and fulfilling and so on. And uh, to try to break out of a conventional day model. And as you can imagine, it was hugely controversial because she set a date and she grabbed the bull by the horn, set a date, uh, and uh, and in a sense, all hell broke loose because the families were, that relied on some, having some place to send somebody during the day were now facing the fact that maybe there isn't such a place, but that they would have, you know, lose that rather than focus on what they might gain. And for the individuals, it could have been upsetting. And certainly for the staff, it was upsetting because now their jobs are in jeopardy. Uh, and who, know, who else, uh, you know, it could have been many others that were upset. But there was a lot of upset as she reported it. But she held her ground and the board of the agency backed her up and they got through that. Uh, but that was a very piece of, a big piece of decisive leadership. So when the, that f battle was fought and won, um, then it set the stage for the current uh, leaders of the service uh, to uh, try to do something with those goals. And, uh, and they went ahead uh, and, you know, in a sense, started on the Monday uh, to try to do that. Now, uh, you, know, the, um, uh, you know, the fact that they have stayed doing it indicates that it was viable and feasible in that way. Uh, this is a small town uh, where uh, it's possible to work in formal networks because that's the way small towns are. So much of what they do wouldn't be visible as a service. It would just look like people doing ordinary things. Um, and uh, they're quite clear about that, that they want to keep it informal. They want it to be normalizing for people. And they want it to be, of course, fruitful for people. So you know, if you went looking for the program, what you'd have to do is go looking for the people. Like, what are they up to today? And uh, what do they normally do? And, you know, what, uh, you know, what are they up to, really? Um, and uh, so for people used to kind of building-centered or center-based custodial programs where much of what happens is inside, um, then this is a very different uh, thing because there isn't a building you go to. It's a set of things you do that you go to, and uh, that may change over time. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, it's a very instructive example for people who have never seen that. Now, uh, why I say that that's, that's not the only place that's done that is because there lots of people have gone down that road of trying to find uh, alternatives, but the very fact that they've stayed with it um, is instructive, and also that you know, it is a, it's a workable alternative to... Uh, uh, these building-centered uh, based programs because people tend to have put a lot of faith in the, the fact that there's a building there and there's staff there and there's money there 
and that that is you know, really going to make some kind of difference, and it may not. Here they're trying to, uh, in a sense, start with qualitative objectives that are different from one person to another, and then to pursue those and to challenge themselves to do that well. So it's a pretty, uh, uh, you know, at least at this point in history, a pretty uh, uh, kind of instructive example that you can rethink a service model and a pattern and, uh, and still keep people with you. But at some point, as this uh, executive leader really uh, discovered, you know, you have to get off the fence and make a decision, uh, in this case, a dramatic decision. Others have changed their programs like that more gradually. Um, but that, no matter what you do, at some point, people want the, the, the thing that's there, not the thing that you're trying to promote. And so there is pushback. Uh, opposition, conflict, uh, dissension, and so on. And if you're not ready to kind of engage that, then you may not uh, ever get out of the starting gate because somewhere along the lines, uh, you know, along the line, there will be uh, uh, people that are, are need persuading on this, uh, and uh, and maybe for good reason. And so you really have to kind of take what comes with making a big change like this. Now. I know schemes that made the change 30 years ago and are still in, uh, in these new models. So the idea that it's a kind of fly-by-night uh, alternative isn't the case. Uh, in some cases, I've seen, for instance, shelter workshops that were shut down and everybody got work uh, within a relatively short period of time, and they're all still working 25 years later. So the theme then, you know, in that wasn't sort of a leisure in the community. That was really employment-centered alternatives to center-based programs. But there would be many, uh, uh, many uh, examples now of people who have gone down that road. Uh, the program in, uh, in Littleton, the Common Ground program, uh, isn't as much about employment as it is about life interests, uh, but it could have been about employment if that had been uh, what people were uh, interested in. Um, so, uh, it is a, you know it's an interesting kind of a pioneering example, but not as uh, unusual now as it used to be. I think it would have been more remarkable to people a decade or two uh, ago. So we're now seeing more and more of these kinds of uh, examples. Uh, would it be the uh, example from uh, Ireland of? Uh, uh, Brothers of Charity, County Clare, the example involving Mary Keeley, uh, she was, uh, had a shelter workshop for over a hundred and some people. The shelter workshop doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, and many of those people have gone to work, part-time, full-time jobs. Others have gone uh, into leisure kinds of arrangements, but they're no longer in a shelter workshop. And the shelter workshops really weren't often about work. They were about having a place to go and in many ways, people thought, well, they'll meet people, they have companionship there. Um, and, uh, you know, so you, if, you, you know, if you need companionship, then you're going to have to have companionship in some other form or place and define people, companionship and interests and whatnot. But, uh, you know, there would simply be too many of these now of examples of people who used to be in a day program who are now doing something else. What is rare is where everybody that used to be in the day program is doing something else. Because in that sense, it's comprehensive alternatives to day programs. And what you may still see is the remnants of a bigger day program is now uh, shrinking again, I think. And yet, it's interesting how many um, uh, uh, situations you might need to force that to happen because in the normal course of things nobody's taken the leadership to make it happen uh, and a very interesting example from the United States uh, came from the state of Oregon where an, uh, a legal advocacy group uh, sued the state of Oregon under a particular American law that said you're violating people's rights by having them in a shelter workshop and, uh, and they, they won the case in federal court, and it created a huge problem for 
the, uh, because it was now illegal to have shelter workshops. Um, now, it may get appealed at the, eventually uh, to the highest level, but at this point, uh, around the country now, you're starting to see states that are saying, we're no longer admitting people to shelter workshops because they may be illegal under federal law, and so we're going to create alternatives to sheltered workshops. And so the, the legal action, in kind of sense, forced the issue. But you can force the issue without you know, legal cases. You can force it simply on its merits. And so the, going back to common ground, had there not been that decisive leadership, there wouldn't have been the creating of the opportunity to try something different. And again, it wasn't a legal dispute. No, it was a policy dispute uh, in which there were people arguing both sides, and one side prevailed. And that made it possible then to proceed with some kind of an experiment. And yet, it's interesting how many um, uh, uh, situations you might need to force that to happen. Because in the normal course of things, nobody's taking the leadership to make it happen. Uh, and a very interesting example from the United States uh, came from the state of Oregon, where an, uh, a legal advocacy group uh, sued the state of Oregon under a particular American law that said you're violating people's rights by having them in a shelter workshop. And, uh, and they, they won the case in federal court, and it created a huge problem for the, uh, because it was now illegal to have shelter workshops. Um, now, it may get appealed at the, eventually uh, to the highest level, but at this point, uh, around the country now, you're starting to see states that are saying, we're no longer admitting people to shelter workshops because they may be illegal under federal law. And so we're going to create alternatives to sheltered workshops. And so the, the legal action, in kind of sense, forced the issue. But you can force the issue without you know, legal cases. You can force it simply on its merits. And so the, going back to common ground, had there not been that decisive leadership, there wouldn't have been the creating of the opportunity to try something different. And again, it wasn't a legal dispute. No, it was a policy dispute uh, in which there were people arguing both sides, and one side prevailed. And that made it possible then to proceed with some kind of an experiment. But in all cases, it requires leadership if there is opposition. And uh, if there's no vision to do it, uh, the people that have the vision to do it may have to take on uh, you know, people that don't, uh, don't support the, the idea of doing it. There's a fair amount of being proactive that's involved in creating uh, this. Uh, again, um, uh, again, I think of Jeff Strelley and uh, his service in uh, Jay Nolan in Los Angeles. There'd be another instance where they decided to, uh, uh, to essentially close their congregate the models. And there was huge division uh, in his board about it. Uh, but eventually they came, uh, they supported him. But it could have been one of those things to make sure you, you as a director never work again with that agency because uh, the people might oppose it. Uh, so again, always uh, with change, there will be opposition. And uh, the opposition could win. So you really have to have people willing to kind of put themselves on the line to see uh, if they can proceed. This is why sometimes doing it a bit slower means you can get some runs on the board um, to sort of make your point and it isn't sort of like uh, you come to the precipice and you have to jump one way or the other. That may be a, a, an unnecessary crisis. But there, either way, uh, the, there is a leadership challenge uh, to kind of make uh, and uh, create something that wasn't there before and really to transform something uh, into something entirely new. Um, I think as uh, you uh, see these examples and you talk to the people that have been involved in them, uh, they, um, they, they, they're, they're often incremental. That the uh, scheme, the congregate programs gradually disappear, maybe one at a time. You think in accommodation that maybe one household kind of 
stops existing and people live, go to live somewhere else. Uh, so they do it one bite at a time. But similarly, in matters of closing or getting people real jobs in the community instead of being in a day program, it may take, it may be a few individuals at a time. And they become the pioneers and then the, in back of them comes a few more and a few more. And finally, the numbers at the conventional day program are diminished and the numbers out doing things are increased. So it's a kind of change in the ratio. So you could almost say a kind of rebalancing to the point where it may reach the, of eliminating the previous congregate uh, center-based uh, program. And uh, so you need leadership all, at every step, but you just may do it in kind of bite-sized elements. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a number of organizations I'm working with in, in, in uh, British Columbia uh, that uh, you know, started with just a few people and uh, just realized, I, well, we can do this. We can get people lives of their own outside of group homes, outside of shelter workshops, outside of day programs, um, and just started trying things. And, uh, you know, they still have uh, uh, some uh, vestiges of the earlier programs, but they're diminished or closed. Um, I remember one was a kind of community center for people with disabilities in Kamloops. It just doesn't exist anymore. It was essentially closed down at a certain point. Um, and it was a program that had support from families, from staff, from other people, but the director bit the bullet, so to speak, and it created space then to create some other alternatives. So, you know, transformation is possible if there is leadership to do it. That's the decisive factor. And the leadership by this, I mean, the leadership that have the vision for uh, the possibility we could do something better and different uh, in a world where some people don't think it's better and don't think it's uh, worth doing, uh, you have to kind of work your way through that. And, uh, you know, obviously people have been willing to do it or we wouldn't have these examples. Mm -hmm.